How's everybody doing? Staying dry? <laughs> My name is Bob Browner. I, I build uh, reproduction hawking rifles. And I'm going to give just a little short talk today about hawking rifle architecture from the aspect of a builder. Um, they, uh, they're really a pretty complicated gun. Most people look at them and think, well, just an old uh, half stock rifle, but there's a little more to them than that. They have their own little quirks, and if they're not right, they're not right. <laughs> um, I've been been very fortunate in that I have access to several original Hawking rifles, and I, I get my hands on them, uh, I, I study them, I photograph, measure, feel them. I get as much out of feeling them as, as looking at them, really. And it just, uh, you, you just have to, kind of come to your own conclusions. None of this stuff is written down really or etched in stone or there's no no set right or wrong. It's, it's just uh, everybody, you all heard of the swag, you know, scientific wild ass guess. Well, that's basically all this stuff is. You look at the stuff and analyze it, think about it, come up with your own conclusions. Uh, everybody has their own opinions and different ideas and it's not to say that one is more or less correct than another. It's just everybody's own interpretation. The wag, the wag part of that is easy. Everybody can come up with, uh, with opinions and theories. But you really, really understand these things you have to study. And you just, all you can do is get your hand on as many of the original as you can and study them as closely as you can. Uh, I brought a little uh, an original squirrel rifle here, and I'm going to try and go through the architecture rather quickly and uh, see, get some idea of what it takes to put one of these things together. Um, and after I do that, we'll, we'll have some questions and hopefully I can come up with some answers. Then in the meantime, I'm going to set this microphone down and pick the gun up. And if I, if you can't hear, Say so, I'll try and y'all look a lot. Mm. Bob would help. Somebody held it up and you just pointed to it? Uh, you hold it up? Maybe, maybe. I don't know. If, can, can anybody hear me? Here, let me help. Hold that up. The hawk, the, 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 you can get your mic down. Basically, the squirrel rifles have the same architecture as the plains rifles, only in different proportions. Uh, the biggest difference probably, most of the squirrel rifles are brass, some are iron, but the biggest difference is in the nose cap and entry pipe. On these things, are, they're made in one unit. On a plains rifle, you generally have a, a, a nose cap and a, a separate entry pipe. But the architecture of the guns are the same. They, they, um, they're straight on the bottom of the forearm. A lot of pictures, it look like there's a belly in, but there is no belly. The same with the, with the toe line. It looks like a belly, but it's actually it's two straight lines. You got a straight line that comes from here to the back of the guard, and another straight, straight plane from the back of the guard to the toe. And they come at, a, at an angle, it's like a break at that point. It's actually two straight lines. It's not a, it's not a purse belly, it's not a belly period. Um, generally, they taper front to back through the lock panels, wider at the front, narrower at the back. Um, they, part, I think part of what makes them so complicated is the barrels are wider at the breech and taper to the muzzle. The lock panels are wider at the front and taper to the back the opposite direction of the of the barrel taper. And then you have to you have to get the uh, the breech and lock to mate up to those surfaces and still have the gun operation where you can take the barrel out of it. You know, so they're, they're pretty they're a little complicated. When people show me a gun that, that they built want to assess how they did, uh, the first thing I look at is to turn the gun over and this bottom this bottom surface is flat, and it at the 
it turns to brown, it, it transitions to brown at about the back of the rear trigger. So there's a trans, there's like a little step there. You, you all can come up and look at the thing later on and see for yourself. But there's, that, that's, that's where it uh, makes its transition. Uh, normally, they'll have a, it's like a, like an S, and it's not really, it's, it's raised, but it's not a ridge. It'd be a very subtle high spot that runs from the top of the lock panels, down through the wrist, and then back up through the corner of the butt stock. And it does the same thing on a cheap piece side, except the cheap piece is covering it up. But it, they basically have that same line there also. Um, uh, in my, what I've gained looking at these things, I'm gonna guess probably 80% of the original guns were maple, 20% being walnut. Um, generally, the, uh, and none of this stuff is etched in stone. This is all my wags. You can, uh, you can, uh, you see a lot more of the early JNS rifles with walnut stocks than maple, as a rule. So they made both. Why? Who knows? The boxes, the, the, the patch box, which this gun does not have, when they they came basically two two types of catch. The, the box sometimes will have a, a a catch like a Kentucky rifle with a plunger at the bottom to to, to release it. Probably the most common, well, definitely the most common ones are what I call a cam over. It's got a foot on the bottom of the door with a spring. And that holds the holds a box shut. In my mind, those are, are better because you're not going to bump the butt and have it come open at an opportune time. Um, it's just all off the top of my head here. <laughs> but in, in a nutshell, that's, that's probably Hawking architecture as quickly as I can explain it. Um, it's just uh, a matter of this, the different surfaces and transitions and blending them together and you get that through looking at and feeling the guns you know photographing them and studying any way that you can um, other than that i, I guess what you know, if you guys anybody's got any questions i'll try and answer them you know, let's, let's see what we can come up with I read. bob could you tell us a little about the evolution from Four parts like the butt plate to cast parts and sort of the timing of that. Good question. And they overlap. They overlap, but you see mixed parts on guns. Uh, the early guns are generally always forged. The two-piece butt plate. They'll, 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 they'll come together up here, and there, there'll be a line. You can see a braze line and a rivet and a toe of the butt plate that they held them together when they put them in the forge. And you look at the, if you look at the inside of a original two-piece butt plate, there will be little chunks of brass. They would say, I guess they're scrap brass and little, little chunks usually inside that, that cavity of where the two pieces come together and then they would put them in the forge and melt them together. A lot of times the brass didn't fully melt and you can still see the chunks in the, in the originals. And I have seen cast butt plates that were obviously the mold was made from an original two-piece plate because you can look inside there and see the in the in the in the, uh, the cast plate the chunks of brass that were under one that they that they copied the plate from in the mold you can see you can see little little square pieces that were that were the raised portions of the the, uh, the brass and didn't melt um, they Generally, the earlier guns were all forged parts or sheet metal parts made and welded together or brazed together. Then as, the, as time went on, they, they used more cast parts. The, um, the, the nose cap, what they trigger guard and all that. But you see guns, original guns with mixed parts on them. Some of them have my, my original West Hawken has cast parts, except for the nose cap. It's made out of sheet metal. 
I think what they they were in business to make money, and what they if they needed a if they needed a nose cap or a butt plate that day, and they didn't have any, they they fired up the forge and made whatever they needed. They had the ability to make any part they needed. Um, I have theories about, and this is my wags again. The uh, I think the barrels on the original guns were finished, reamed, and rifled after they were assembled, after the gun was assembled, because the, normally, you see a few of them with dovetail loops. You know, loops are put in with a dovetail, but most of the original guns are staked in, that have stapled that are staked in, and are done so deeply that it has to, would have to deform that material and push it into the bore of the of the gun, so I, that's why I think they had to have put those staked in staples in before final reaming and rifling of the barrels. I think they did that in the shop. Um, I have a piece of cut off barrel from an original gun. It's you know it's it was short, it was amputated, and it had a side slot cut in it. Well, when it was restored, it, the barrel was cut off behind the slot to keep from patching that. What I'm saying is I have, the, I have the hunk of barrel and the bore is good on it. I drove a lead slug through that piece of barrel and it fits perfectly in my original gun. It was the same caliber, same same uh, configuration with the rifling and everything. I'm sure that they did that in the shop themselves. Um, there are a lot of variation in the guns. As Jake and Sam didn't build all of them. They probably built uh, a minority of the original guns themselves. They had other people working in the shop with them. Um, uh, the uh, the under ribs are generally, well not generally, they're always hollow. They were formed around a mandrel and uh, screwed or riveted onto the barrels with the, uh, the hollow ends filled with solder to, or solder or lead to, to fill the fill the gaps in my colonial. Um, the squirrel rifles, they they were in the business of making money. And I've, I've a number of them, they usually always have some used parts on them. This little gun has a used barrel. There's a closed dovetail on top. And the lock was originally a front lock. You can see where the uh, the frizzing spring screw and, and frizzing spring or screw was, uh, was plugged and the lock plate just reduced in size and they built, built the gun with it. Uh, usually it's very common on a score rifles to see where the underneath the bolster will be like a uh, fitted and closed raised in dovetail. The, the, they were I, I'm assuming that they would take guns in on trade and scavenge the parts and recycle. Um, they were they were in the business to make money and they were doing doing it as efficiently as they could. That's really about all I have here. It's like, this gun is about a 40 caliber. The squirrel rifles generally are 40 or a little bit smaller. Then you, every once in a while you see a kind of a gun that's in between squirrel rifle and plains rifle and they'll be a little larger caliber and a little longer, a little longer gun. Um, the early guns tend to be, and none of this stuff is, that's, you know, none of, this, none of this stuff is black and white, but as a rule the earlier guns are, are narrower, slimmer, more, uh, lighter than the, than the later guns, they, they tended to get kind of <coughs> kind of fat, chunky towards the end compared to the earlier stuff. How about the blue? Blue or brown? Both. That's another wag. <laughs> uh, the, the best guns that I've seen condition-wise were blue, rust blue, case hardened, Case hardened uh, lock, uh, breech, butt plate trigger guard, and the, and the other, the other parts. Um, 
they, my guess is they probably came both ways, but the, the seemed like the, uh, the, 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 the better condition guns I've seen were blue. That's not to say that they all were. Question comes up about flint locks. I've seen one original Hawking rifle, and it was obviously a St. Louis gun. It just says Hawking on it. But it's um, original flint, but it doesn't look like what we think a St. Louis Hawkins yeah. should look. So I'm thinking that was, you know, that's, that's, I'm convinced it's the earliest gun that I've, St. Louis gun that I've ever seen. St. Louis gun. Um, they, they, people ask about flint locks. I don't do. I, I just, I just don't. What about side options? Sight options. Yeah. Um, they came with various, various rear sights. The front sights are usually always silver blade with copper base. Sometimes you see them with, a, with an iron base, but are usually silver copper. The back sights they come from a wide variety, and I'm not so sure that I don't know how many of them. A guy got the gun and didn't like the sight, knocked it out, put something else in. You know, there's there such a long life and so much they were used, well used, and it's hard to, a lot of times it's hard to guess what the gun has or hasn't had done to it. It's, in a nutshell, I'd say it varies. <laughs> so you would, be, you would be okay with putting any type of sight shows? With that, with that. If you were building one, you could put any sight shows and it would be okay? There would be a period for it. I would, you know. When I build a gun, I, if I'm, unless I'm copying a particular gun, I, I, we usually always make the sight. There's, you know, there's always variation and hard, hard to come up with a particular casting to make one. So I just, I just make them. Um, but I, I would not hesitate to put whatever rear sight a guy wanted on one. Some of them, they have a long, the long leaf sight with the elevators on Those are, you see those too, from time to time. It just, uh, I, again, it might be what they did that day, you know. It's, you don't know, nobody knows for how many of these guns were built to order or how many were just built and put on a shelf for sale. Nobody knows. And it's, I don't know, <laughs> any more questions? You ever, you ever measured stock and they all have about the same drop? They vary. They're, they're handmade guns that, I mean, they're, they're within boundaries, but they do vary. No two are exactly alike. Um, I've seen two uh, pistol grip guns, there's three of them known, and the two that I've seen side by side are as identical as, as they could be. I have an original S. Hawken. Um, that is a, it's a, I think it's an early S. Hawkins slim gun, and there's a gun in the museum of the fur trade that's architecturally, I'm going to say it's identical to the one that I have. It has a, they both have a strange toe plate that's very seldom seen. It has a little diamond on the end, on the, on the front of it. But those two guns are, they had to have been built closely together. Too, they're too alike not to have. But most of the other ones, most all the other ones, they're their own thing. They're, they're, they're not exactly, not exactly alike. I mean, they have, uh, they vary in length of pull and the crop varies some. I don't know whether that's by design or by accident. I, I don't know. You see guns that the stock is crooked on. People want to say cast off or cast on. I. I think it may be warpage. <laughs> There's nobody, nobody knows for sure. You can, you know, you can make anything you want, and that's your, that's your way. You know, but it just, you just look at as many of them as you can and come up with your own, your own conclusions. Most of them, you think a plain top will be in half stock. You see full stocks also. You see full stocks. You see full stock, uh, 
squirrel rifles. Um, the vast majority are half stocked, but there are many full stock rifles out there. I think, uh, you know, off the top of my head, like 26 bucks for a half stock flames rifle, but the, the full stock were a couple dollars cheaper. So they didn't have to, they didn't have to make a rib, attach that to the barrel, and then attach the, <coughs> attach the pipes to the rib. There's more people, there's, to me, there's a lot more work in a half stock gun than a full stock gun. You can, Shaping the forearm out is pretty straightforward. Um, these are, you got to contend with the uh, entry pipe and nose cap right there together and, and, and the under rib. And then, well, one other thing, they sometimes the guns can be a little taller up by the entry pipe than they are um, back at the breech, slightly. And I think what that was, the way they accomplished that, they had to drill the hole for the ramrod with the bit favored up so that it would go slightly at an angle up to keep from coming out the bottom of the stock. Um, they, there was a lot of, they didn't just come up with this thing overnight. They, 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 they engineered it went through a lot of trial and error. They're, they're actually a pretty complicated gun, really, when you break them down. The parts are so long, the trigger bars are, and they're not all long trigger bars, but a typical plane rifle will have a long, long bar trigger. They'll have a long, a long tang, and it's always tapered or hourglass or something, not just straight. And they're just, uh, they're, they're really a, fairly complicated gun to build. And that's the only, the only reason that I can come up with why, is the parts are so long and everything is tapered. And they're, they're, not just a, they're not just a plain old half stock rifle. Well, the only mentioned on the architecture, there were two lines, like the toe plate of the trigger, and there was another line we were talking about. Can you build that again real quick? Along the bottom here? Yes. Yeah, this, and again, this varies too, but not, not much. There'll be basically a straight line, say from straight down from where the, 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 uh, the, the, where the trigger guard is, basically a straight line from here to the toe, and basically a, a short straight line from the, from the uh, breaking the triggers, between the triggers, back to that guard. And they come at they this, it, yeah. This and then. So it's kind of it gives the illusion of a of a fish belly. They're not fish belly. The, the, the forearm, those should be all. You know, you, could, you can't say never about a whole lot with these things, but you can probably say never with bellies in the in the stock anyway. The the, the comb line is a generally a straight line up until about the last inch or two, and then it can fall down a little bit. Why, I don't know, but that's just the way, the way they are. Okay, thank you. That's, that's about all I know. <laughs> Anybody got any more questions or? Bob, you want to talk a little bit about the evolution of the design of the breach, you know, the snail and all that? That is complicated too. They um, the early guns, the, the JNSs generally have a bigger, a much bigger bolster than the later guns, and that's not always true either. But generally those are brazed on the side of the barrel. And they have a the, the, the break is the uh, standing breech is separate with a, uh, a plug in the barrel with a hook on it that goes in fits into the standing breech. Um, later guns they, I think they forged some breaches probably, which would have been a very difficult thing to do. Uh, then they progressed with the cast bars to cast, cast two-piece cast breaches. The squirrel rifles have a, what's called just a patent breach. It's a, it's, they look like the other ones, but they don't break. That's the, 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 they call a semi-patent. The, uh, 
the plains rifles generally, and not always, but generally have the full pad breech with the with the brake, so that you can pop the barrel out of the gun without without taking the uh, the screws out of the tank. Uh, and they they varied. Some you see some some guns like this one has a pretty short breech, front to back. Uh, some of them are longer. Some of them are, look like they, to me, they look like they took the breech and squeezed it in a vise. They're almost not really round. You know, they, they have a different shape. To them. Why? Who knows? You know, it could be they got them from. I think they they were probably purchasing their cash parts. There was a um, uh, a foundry just. Most of the gun makers' row was around the north leg of the arch within that area. Well, north of there was a, a foundry, and I think they probably made parts for the Hawking shop. Then again, nothing's, nothing's ever been discovered that's been written down. But they, uh, I think they had the ability, if they needed a breach that day, they could make one. <coughs> The triggers are generally double set, meaning you can fire the uh, fire the gun without setting the trigger. Uh, but then again, not all of them are that way either. It's, there's a fair amount of variation in the parts. The part that's, that's consistent on the things more than anything is the architecture of the guns. They all uh, they, they have certain parameters that they all fall within. I wish I could explain it further, further but I can't. <laughs> Anybody else got any questions? So how do you build your guns? Do you use the for the stock? Do you buy parts and assemble it? I have, uh, for my gun, my, I'm doing two now, a JNS and an S. For my S Hawking rifles, I have a really good original that I made a pattern for. And I have my stocks uh, pre-carved with, with only the barrel channel on the outside, not no way running for it, so you can use whatever block and trigger you want. And then I, I use, uh, for the S-Hawkins, it's the, the same breach that you can get from Track of Wolf. I don't know if Pete Allen makes them or Eleanor, whoever makes them. And then just file them up, look at the books and study them and file them up how you Want it to look for my JNS Hawkins. I had a, a machine shop in Montana machine some uh, some breeches. It's a much longer <clears throat> front to back. The bolster is much longer. It looks like when you look at the side of it, it looks like a I call it a conquistador hat looking breech. They got the you know the, 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 the fences on both sides and then the, the flat vertical part in the middle. And they, uh, not all of them had that, but that was very common on the JNS period guns. Uh, the locks, I, I used to use Bob Rollers, but he's not making them anymore, so I, Davis locks are what I use in Davis triggers. And it, uh, I have a casting from Dodge Stith for the uh, a butt plates and the trigger guards are the one out of track of the wolf. And the sights, uh, Depending on the gun that I'm building, sometimes I'll use a, a, a casting, and other times if I'm copying a particular gun or whatever, I, I will just file it out. The barrels, I like rice barrels. I used to use DHAs, but Mark is not with us anymore. Um, rice makes a very good barrel. Casting or a nose cap, I usually make those uh, out of sheet metal with uh, two pieces and solder solder together. <clears throat> the entry pipes I use in casting or are I'll just bend them, you know, just depending on what I'm, the gun that I'm building. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you'll want an arm made. That's, that's the parts in a nutshell. 
Anybody else got any questions? Mm -hmm. I can think of something to ask. <laughs> There, I think you said well ago they were tapered or were they straight barrels? I'm going to say probably 80 or 90 percent of them are tapered. There, you do, the line of the every once in a while you do see straight barrels. Sometimes you see a small barrel. Yeah. But normally they're, they have some tape. Right. Uh, even with this whole uh, yeah. I guess they, they just make a whole uh, right. wider. Yeah, they come. I've the shortest barrel original guns that haven't been cut off that I've seen is probably the Carson gun. Kit Carson gun has got like a 31 something inch barrel. Most of them were 34 to 38 inches. Sometimes, uh, especially the earlier guns, you might see one a little bit longer. Uh, the later guns, as a rule, and this is a very loose rule, as, as a rule, about 36 inches. As far as the rifling twist, I don't know. I don't, I'm not sure that I'm not sure exactly what that was. I, you know, I can measure it and guess at it. Yeah, but it's it's, it's generally I, on, on the guns that I build, I like 60 inch twist. And it's right in the middle, anywhere between. Anywhere between 60, 66, or 72, I can't tell the difference on the way they shoot there. They're all, they all shoot very well. Hey, hey Bob, you're going to be over at the Sappington House after this? Yes, we will be at the Sappington House, which is as far as you can go that way. <laughs> yeah. The big, big frame house up on the hill. Okay. And if ever, I encourage everybody to definitely come by. There's a fantastic display of original and reproduction guns up there. It's just well worth the, well worth the walk up the hill. Well, thank you, Bob.